The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this afternoon's Gold Group session with your host, Willie Miranda. Hey, good afternoon, Gold members. Thank you very much for being on today's call. Uh, today is a very... I don't know, very hot day up here in Albany, New York. I bet you it's in the mid-80s right now. And um, it, it's funny, I was just, just outside of my driveway. I had a new driveway put in, and we just had our, we're having our, our building remodeled, and the blacktop company did both places. And um, it's just amazing, you know, this time of the year, just how things just switch so quick for us here in upstate New York. It went from being cold and rainy uh, to, like, really within just the last week or two, it just got really hot. So, um you know, it just it's, it's, it's this time of the year that I really enjoy being here in upstate New York. The rest of the time, I'd probably rather be in Florida or out in beautiful uh, California. Every time I go out there, I really enjoy it. Um, but you know, some updates that are going on that are going on with me. Uh, we re we're in a total remodel project, which uh, hopefully uh, next call I'll be able to give you guys some before and after shots. I have my uh, office being remodeled and redone, and it should, I just talked to my builder about 10 minutes ago, and he said pretty much everything's good to go and we should have our CO uh, next Wednesday, which would be great, and we can start moving in and, and doing business again. But we've been down really since uh, probably the beginning of November and getting it all remodeled. And why I bring it up on the call today is because uh, when I first bought the building and, and back in 98, but then when I started to uh, back probably in 07, 08, decided I was going to knock them down and, and build a big building and have all these private offices for my agents and, and – um, what I started to see, the trend I started to see with technology and smartphones and tablets and you know iPads, um, that the real estate office of the future is really, really non-existent. It's almost uh, no office at all. Um, but what I see that with my agents and polling my agents is that they do want a nice place to bring their customers to, to have a nice conference room area, to have a place where they can come in, use a computer, use a fax machine, use the copier, um, you know, process their paperwork and get out. Um, so over the last, uh, really the last two years, we've been kind of watching it, kind of getting on average how long the agent stays in the office, and it's only been maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so looking at some different models out there, especially one, one of my friends had a Remax model here in, in town and ended up uh, pretty much going bankrupt pretty much because he had uh, like 8,000 square foot worth of space, had all these private offices that the agents were, were buying and renting from him. And you know, as the market changed and as time went on, they just never leased it. They, you know, they rather just work out of their home offices. Uh, so he ended up downsizing a couple times, and it just got behind the eight ball on it. But um, you know, I'm really excited to see that this office is going to be uh, everything's you know pretty much brand new. We just rehabbed it, remodeled it, uh, right down to the studs, and it's going to be um, something that is going to definitely attract more agents to us, um, but also attract more clients to us. And uh, already I'm seeing uh, the buzz going on in the community, uh, you know, looking, anticipating a grand opening. So I'll keep you guys posted on it, but I always like to share current events and what's going on with me and my business. Uh, our business is really going well. Uh, March was a little bit slower than last year, uh, but April was phenomenal. We had like uh, 57 uh, deal pendings in April, uh, where the April prior we had about 42. And uh, this year, uh, we're finding that uh, we had a, a pretty bad winter, so now we're going into the spring season, or actually into the summer season, I should say, in a, in a few weeks. But uh, spring was uh, pretty late this year, so we're starting to see a lot of activity. Uh, so far from April 30th uh, to today's date, we had 22 pendings coming in, so we're anticipating hopefully having a record May um, uh, this year in 2015 versus what we did last year. So that's a quick update with me. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about, and I think this is something that we all, you know, whether you're a single agent or you're an agent with a team or if you're a broker, uh, this call I feel is going to benefit you because it's something that's very, very important uh, that we keep our eye on. And it's something that I have to admit that um, I made a lot of assumptions that certain things were being done and processed the way that uh, we had originally set them up in my office. And um, just one person can cause total havoc uh, on, on an organization. So uh, when I was out at the conference out in Anaheim, I, you know, I I'd, uh, really really have to check into the office. I have my, my brother who's a general manager. Uh, but something I had to call for a certain client that had called my cell phone, and I called him, and he said, yeah, I'll give you a call. He says, um, yeah, you know, no big deal. I'm handling it when you get home. But, you know, when you get back, you know, we have to have a meeting. I have to 
talk to you about something and I says well you know I, I can't go four or five days uh, with that in my mind what's going on right um, and he says well he says um, the staff we, we found a couple problems with some of the processes that are going on in the office and um, we had 40 listings over the last so many months we had more than 40 listings but 40 of the listings that we took out of maybe 65 um, didn't have a plan launched to them and as a result of that it's causing havoc with the agents causing havoc with the clients it's causing havoc with um, uh, with the staff the current support staff so he says but I'm on it see you when you get back enjoy California and we'll talk about it so I said okay so I left let it go and came back and um, sat down with them, went over some different things and what was going on. And the long and short of it is um, Julie, which has been with me for a very long time, and she's been with me almost 12 years, um, felt that um, you know, she was just a little too busy to input data into Top Producer, which meant that she was too busy to um, launch the plan uh, for those listings and felt she was pretty confident by just using a checklist that she had just a bunch of files in a, in a pile that she could just go through and check them off as they went and keep up with everything. And then as the days went on and she got more and more listings and um, it got more and more complicated, um, the system crashed on us. And what I mean by that is we had agents saying, hey, Willie, um, you know, Brian, I, I, I gave you guys this listing and, you know, part of our listing presentation is that we're going to have you know the sign rider on and we're gonna have virtual tours up on the website and you know it's been 20 days 22 days now since I've had it on the market and it's still not on what's going on I said that's ah, kinda weird maybe she you know missed it or there's a glitch in the system or maybe it was checked off uh, by accident and it wasn't done um, and, but then we started getting multiple um, complaints on certain things uh, we had a client call the office uh, and said hey I uh, closed with you guys three weeks ago and your sign is still on my front lawn. So uh, I took it out and I was really upset you didn't come get it. Um, I called the office and uh, they said they, you know, someone would take care of it. And it's now three weeks later, your sign is on the side of my building, uh, which at the time when my sign guy went to go pick it up, was the panel was bent and it was sitting on the side of the house. Uh, we had another customer come in uh, with their lockbox. Uh, they came in with their lockbox with their actual old door handle on it. So it was just a door handle. If you could just imagine this, we had a, an electronic uh, key box um, came in and said, "Here's your key box back, and um, you know uh, you can keep the key because I changed the lock, but I'm um, dropping this off to you because no one picked it up." Um, and then the list goes on and on. But my, my the, what I'm trying to point out here is that there's three things that you have to have in a successful business. All right, you got to have uh, people, processes. In a product, right? Those are the three P's. And for those of you that watch um, uh, CNBC, and there's a great, uh, actually, he's coming out again. You should definitely look it up. Uh, it's called the Profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. I think uh, they come back on next Tuesday, May 12th, and, I, and I've watched every episode of it, and it's great, great information for any entrepreneur uh, looking to better their business. But in there, Mark Lemonis, uh, which is a multi-multi-millionaire, probably close to a billionaire, uh, talks about the three P's you got to have in business, which is uh, those three things that I just mentioned. So people, I feel we have great people, we have great culture. Uh, Julie's been with me 12 years, Tina 10 years. Um, Diane's been with me for my insurance and real estate 20 years. I mean, the list goes on and on. I have really solid people. Um, but she got a little complacent, a little lazy, and um, she didn't have a lot of supervision um, because my brother was out of town, I was out of town. And when he came back and, uh, you know, she was putting out things as they came through and not really telling us. Uh, so if someone called and, you know, a sign was on the lawn, oh, geez, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'll get someone right out there. And she would get someone out there. Uh, or if, you know, someone's lockbox was still on there, uh, she'd have someone run out and get it. But the point is none of that should have taken place if the proper procedures and processes were, were, um, uh, were put into effect as they should have been when the listing came through. So um, so long and short of it, we had a meeting, uh, as we do every week, and I joined the meeting on and sat down with them, and, you know, they explained to me what happened, and she, you know, immediately said, you know, and she was upset and crying and, you know, went over the whole procedure as to what happened. And, um, you know, my conversation uh, with all of them was pretty much, 
and at that point it hit me, you know, I live right, I've not lived, but my office is right across the street from McDonald's. And we were having our conference um, in my little conference room. And I told him, you know, it's all turn around, look out the window. What do you see? And the McDonald franchise. I said, there you go. I said, McDonald franchise. Would you guys, you know, say that McDonald's is a pretty successful uh, franchise organization? Absolutely. I said, if I was to go in and buy that McDonald franchise today, and tomorrow I said, come on, guys, I want you guys to come work for me. We're going to, you know, run this McDonald franchise now. Could I go in there and change the golden arches over there, yellow, so I'm going to paint them blue? No. Can I go and uh, change the, because I don't like the hamburger buns, and uh, you go next door to the bagel shop and say, I'm going to use bagels instead of uh, the buns that they use? No. Um, can I change the French fries? I don't like these. I want to put homemade sliced uh, sweet potatoes in there because uh, I'm a health, you know, on a health kick, and I want to have sweet potatoes. No, you can't do that. I said that's exactly what my organization um, should should be as well. You guys know the plans. You know exactly what we have set up. We've mastered these over the years. And I said, um, Julie, that's exactly what you did here in my business. You painted that sign blue. You changed the hamburger buns here. By you not launching those plans, you decided to do it your way and not our way. And as a, as a result of that, it's caused a lot of headaches for my agents, uh, the staff, uh, and also we had some, you know, obviously some complaints from the clients. So, you know, moving forward, what are we going to do different? And, you know, obviously she says, well, you know, obviously I got to do the plans. Gotta, yeah, and you also have to let us know if you're running behind. Uh, if you are behind or if you need to catch up, you know, you can come in earlier, stay late, you come on the weekends, whatever it may be. But the point is that these plans need to be followed, okay? So today what I want to really talk to you about is really what plans do you have in your organization um, that is assuring that you're delivering the same consistency over and over again with all of your listings and all of your buyers? Um, you know, and that goes back to the whole McDonald theory is, you know, why does a McDonald hamburger here in Albany, New York, taste the same that it does in, you know, uh, Anaheim, California? Is because they have a process. So I'm going to share with you our process today, and this is the updated version, and I had uh, my office manager, Tina, shoot them over to me so I can share them with you. But, uh, and again, I'm not going to go through every little piece of it, but I just want to kind of walk you through it so that um, this is the things that you should be thinking about for yourself. And I don't care if you're a single agent, um, team agent, doesn't matter. It applies to everyone. Uh, and more so if you're a single agent, because as you get busy and you get busier in, in, in the system, you're going to need to have good processes in place to deliver the results that you need. Now, a product, some people say, well, you know, 3Ps doesn't work for me, Willie, because, uh, you know, I don't have a product when I'm not selling a widget. Well, <clears throat> in, in our business, in the real estate business, we're in the service industry and our product is our service. And our service is what we can deliver to these people um, consistently, um, you know, as clients for us, and and, and obviously getting their home sold uh, in the least amount of time with the least amount of hassles uh, for for most money as we can, right? So that's our job. So when we take a listing on, this is called WMJ Team Listing Plan. Uh, basically, you could see once that gets launched, there's on day zero, there's um, I don't know, probably a good. 20, 25 different to-dos there and a couple that are after uh, after that. But look at some of these different things on there. Add it to CyRep, that's our commercial board um, and also our LMLS board. Uh, launch uh, the graduating pricing if applicable, right? So in our listing packets, and I'll go over those with you in the future, and I think we have a webinar that we did last year on it. I went over my listing presentation. I get automatic uh, price reductions from my uh, sellers at the time of listing. So in other words, if I say, hey, we're going to list your house at 300000 but if it doesn't sell in 21 days, then we need to drop that down to 290 And if in 42 days it doesn't sell, then we need to go down to 180 and so forth. So I get that ahead of time. So they already launched that and already have the to-do set. So when those 21 and 42 days come up, they're able to go ahead and apply those plans. Uh, post to Craigslist. Put into homes.com. Order the sign right through the sign company. Uh, add the text writer to the Excel sheet so that we have tracking of each and every one of our text writer signs so we can match it to what property that it goes to. Uh, updating our showing time, that's our showing service. Uh, ask the agent if they're going to be having an open house. Why? Because if they are going to have an open house, we need to launch an open house plan, certain things that need to be done on that. 
with advertising and everything else. Uh, we want to add it to the active listing to our categories, right? So that when we go into top producer and we click on active listings, all of our listings are going to come up. Right now, we're handling about 242 uh, active listings uh, that are in our inventory. Um, so load it into MLS, save the listing uh, paperwork in, active list in the active listing folder. So everything we do is paperless. So what we do is we scan all the documents and we have it on our server in the active listing folder, and that's where we put it based on address. Uh, assign a, assign and, um, and put the log of the lockbox in the log on the Excel sheet. Uh, I can't tell you, you know, it's fine when you only have a few listings, but think about 200 and, uh, you know, plus listings and not knowing where your lockboxes are, right? Those things are like 100 bucks a piece. You need to know where those are. Um, we have certain docs that we put up on MLS. We review the file. We uh, send the partially listed listing to the listing agent to see if it's okay. So once my team puts all the information in, puts all the photos in, puts all the remarks in, uh, they have a to-do here that first day to send it over to the agent and say, okay, Mr. Agent, uh, take a look at it, see what you think, and if there's any changes you need, let me know. And if not, we go ahead and, and launch it. Uh, add it to the success website. Uh, review the MLS sheet. Make sure there's no typos. Give it to someone else for a second set of eyes. Um, save the photos to our active photo listing. Post it in postlets. Now there's something going on with Zillow that uh, our MLS is not participating with Zillow. So now we have to post everything on postlets in order for it to get on Zillow. Um, so the list goes on and on. We opt them on Infusionsoft, which is our marketing uh, program that we have. Uh, we add if it's an agent generator or company generated to the user defined field. Um, so as you guys can see, the list goes on and on on here, but there's a lot of stuff that we do that first week. And the best part is that none of that has my name on it. So when you're hiring people and you're looking for a good assistant once you get busy, um, you want to make sure that these are all the things that you're doing right now um, that an assistant can be doing for 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour. And you want to make sure that you take your name off of all of these categories or where it's assigned to and that person gets on there to handle all that business for you. All right, and then after that, you'll see that, um, you know, we print the report out, they verify the plans are complete, so there's another, uh, see there, Tina Ryder, that's been implemented now. She is my um, office manager, and she thought things were going okay, and she, you know, felt Julie's been there for a long time, she didn't have to check on her. Well, guess what, now she has to verify that the plan and to-dos are completed. That comes up three days after that listing is, is launched. Um, Tina's going in there to make sure everything is done. So there's a second set of eyes on her. Um, verifying property in Zillow. And then look at this. Notify the agent to call for reduction on day 30. Um, you'll see that. You'll see it on day 90, day 60, right? So every 30 days, it's coming to me. Um, well, actually, Julie gets it as a pop up and then she'll send me a text. Hey, call 123 Main Street. Call, you know, Mr. Jones. And, you know, we need a price reduction. So that prompts me to make sure that I'm staying on top of these and keeping these listings from becoming stale. Um, 120 days, repost the postlets, right? It's only good for, I guess, 120 days. A lot of this stuff I don't even know because they, they handle it. But this is why it's in there, because they found that after 120 days, postlet drops the listing. So they have to repost it. Um, again, notifying the agent and then reposting it again at well, day 180. So, um this is good information right on here for you guys to take a look at, and I wanted to make sure that you saw it. Um, so that's, I'm sorry, that's for the team agent. So that's agents that are on my team when they have a listing. That's the plan that's launched. When they launch my plan, you'll see on here, um, there's a couple things that are changed. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but they're pretty much all the same. Um, but some of this stuff, more Tina Ryder is handling, my, off, my assistant. She's the one that's doing weekly follow-up emails every week with that customer. Right, so every week she's sending these, uh, this customer all these weekly follow-up emails uh, for as long as we have the listing. So I make sure that I'm constantly communicating with that customer. Uh, the, the biggest mistake you can make is by being silent with your seller. Whether you have something to tell them or not, you have to make sure that you're following up with them on a weekly basis. And I learned that from Craig many years ago. He had Tammy Johnson uh, that was his customer service rep, and she would call faithfully every week to those listings to make sure uh, that they had some type of uh, communication, you know, letting them know that, hey, I have nothing to report to you this week, but, you know, you had so many showings on, on the website or you had so many uh, agents hit on your link 
uh, whatever the situation may be, they put it on there. Here's some of the feedback on your showings. Um, so it's good information. So once that's done, um, you know, and the listing is on there, um, once it goes pending, there's a whole other, you know, set of plans that we do for pending. Uh, this is the in independent plan. I'm not going to sh really show you that. That's for some of our different agents. But we also have it for um, for buyer pending plans. Once a contract comes in on the buyer side, we'll go ahead and, and get a copy of the contract. Uh, we'll set the pending file up. We'll tag the client as pending now in Top Producer. Uh, we enter all their information into Top Producer. We'll search for the contact on Market Leader, see if it's on Market Leader to see if it was a company generated lead. Uh, or you know we'll take them off there so we're not continuing to market to them. Uh, if there's a contest that we're running, we'll make sure that that gets put into the contest. Um, we'll add them to our Google Docs so we can keep track of our sales. Uh, and then right there, that to do usually 45 days out, it'll pop up to la launch a, a buyer plan. And this is where Christina will call the agent and say, you know, how are we doing with this? And do you have a clear to close? And usually it's within a couple of weeks of that date. And then she's able to move that forward and then launch a closing plan. Uh, the closing plan looks like this, where she verifies the, um, the to-dos are all done and completed. It's tagged as closed. Customer surveys are sent out to these people. Uh, we send the contact to Zillow Review. So that's how we get our Zillow reviews, by sending the contact uh, a link to give us reviews on Zillow. Um, change the contact closed to, um, from active. And um, again, list goes on and on, but we want to make sure that we close it right on here so that all the information is good. Like, like databases are really good, but they're only as good as the information that you're putting into it, right? Um, but we even go one step to make sure and verify that the transaction is closed on the MLS. Uh, how many times at the end of the year you go to pull up your numbers and you have 7, 10, 15, you know, sometimes we've had 25 uh, different uh, closings that should have happened for us that weren't in our favor that either the agent forgot to close still showed pending um, because they didn't have a process or a system in place and we didn't get the credit so we we make sure and we're always within if we're not right on track with MLS we're only off maybe by one or two and uh, Christina is very good at getting right on it okay so that's the uh, that's some of the buyer and seller plans that we have on that and uh, I thought it was important to show you guys uh, what that looked like we also have um, a checklist for all contract submission that we give to our agents. So we want to make sure that you know they're they're completing the right things when they need to. They're collecting things that are not going out to the consumer, um, you know, multiple times because that's what clients hate. You know, geez, I just gave you that information, or you know, this is the third time I had to stop by your office and drop something off. Um, and if you don't have a process or anything to go by, you just end up winging it. So. Here's the actual sheet that we use on any new contract submission. Make sure that the agent makes a copy of it, makes a copy of the checks. Uh, make sure that they scan it and email it to management at mrgteam.com. Um, and then they have to complete the following. In order to get a commission check, they got to make sure that they have a fully executed contract, all the disclosures are done. And if they don't have this stuff filled out, they don't get a check. Uh, and I don't care who they are. Uh, if you don't have all the documents to me for compliance reasons, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you didn't earn your money yet. All of this has to be completed when we close to make sure that we're in compliance. And once this file has been done and everything is checked off, then we can go ahead and scan it, it's completed, and then that's how they get paid. All right, but that's um, how that sheet works, and it's a great little uh, checklist for, for my agents. Uh, let's see, the last piece here that Tina sent over to me, this is more of the, um, oh, we already went over the listing stuff there. Let me go over here, right here. This is the listing. Uh, submission uh, checklist to submit a listing. Uh, we want to make sure they're getting the full information on their address, email address, all the other things that are on there. And um, you know, the list goes on and on here. Now, before I go to this list, here's what I want to do because I want a little bit more participation uh, from you guys on this call. Actually, as soon as I'm done with this call, I'm going to meet Craig. Craig's actually uh, speaking and doing a half day uh, in Albany tomorrow. I'm going to be sitting on the panel, so I'm going to go meet him uh, just after this call. So we'll probably be ending. Um, a little bit shorter, maybe in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. But in your question box, everyone has a question box. I want you just to list one challenge that you have going on right now in your business. What's one challenge uh, that you guys have right now? Because I want to address them quickly and go through them so that you guys are getting a little bit of um, feedback from me and, and maybe uh, some suggestions uh, uh, and ideas from me. But also, uh, someone else's challenge 
might be a challenge that you have and you don't even know about yet. So it would be good for you to be able to listen and hear how um, I would address that challenge or, or any feedback that I can give. So just right now, right in the question box, I want you to type in just one challenge that you're going with. And this is not, you know, um, optional. I want everyone to do it so we have 100% on here. Uh, so if you guys just take a quick second right now as I'm talking and just type in a, a quick challenge that you're facing and um, we'll, we'll address that. Okay, so back to this checklist uh, for submitting a listing. Uh, we want to make sure we have all this information on here. We want to make sure the graduated pricing strategy sheet is filled out right every 21 days, um, making sure that they charge um, the 495 transaction fee. If they waive it, I need to know why. And um, most of the time, it was just going to come right out of their commission. So I tell my agents, um, you know, you could waive it, the 495, but it's going to come off your side. So it's funny when I changed that rule many years ago, uh, I ended up collecting almost 100% of the 495s, uh, where I was told before that no one would pay it. So, all right, so that's uh, what we do on there. But let's look on this. Think about yourself when you're on a listing appointment. Um, you're out there, you know, getting the key, making sure you have the key, making sure you have the contract, uh, the different disclosures that you need to have. So you're checking off everything on there right in front of the client, making sure that you have the, you know, the different forms fill out for the signs, making sure you got a copy of the taxes, the deed, the plot plan, the survey. All these different questions and all these forms are attached uh, to this list here. And this is what we're asking them. Uh, we want to make sure that we go through this so that we're doing the right job for the client. Um, from day one. Uh, when I've had agents in the past that haven't, you know, follow these uh, um, these rules or these plans, uh, they end up, end up getting in a lot of trouble, they end up getting complaints, and if we want to get repeat and referral business, like I've been showing you guys a lot, uh, in order to get repeat and referral business, we need to be make sure that we're giving great customer service and that we're fulfilling those three P's. And by having a good operation plan and good systems in place uh, is how you're going to do it. All right, so any questions on that, um, raise your hand in the question box. And if you have any questions pertaining to the, the listing plan or the buyer plan or any of the stuff that we have on here, um, let me know and I will address them. And the other thing I can do is I can um, uh, email you this. I could forward you this email if you want. Just shoot me an email at wmiranda at mrgteam.com and I'll make sure to get this out to you guys so you have it. All right, so that is the plan process. So let's see what we have on here for um, for some questions. I always like the, the questions and the feedback. So David Larson says, finding a good candidate for administrative function that is reasonably priced. So finding a good candidate for administrative functions that is re reasonably priced. So um, the question, how I read it, David, is that you're looking for um, a good admin person uh, that's at a reasonable price and that is going to do a good job for you. And I just had that conversation with one of our coaching members this afternoon. I had a one-on-one -on -one, um, with, with uh, one of our coaching members, John. And, and John is in the process right now where he feels he's spending so much time on doing all these admin activities that he doesn't have time to put work time into his business to work on the marketing side. Um, you know, to get his editorials ads, to get his postcard ads, to get all those things that he knows that's going to generate business. And instead, he's uploading listings and taking pictures and running to the bank and going here and going there. So my advice to John was, John, sit down and, and really figure out all the different things that you're doing on, uh, over the next week or two. Write them all down every hour on the hour. Write them down what you do. And then at the end of the day, what I want you to do is circle all the different things that you can delegate to the assistant that would have saved you time to work on your business. And that is the job description for your next hire. So that's the first piece. The other piece is that you need to find someone that's going to be good. Now, what I've done in the past, and everyone has their own opinions, but what I've done in the past is that I go right to my center of influence, and I let them know that, hey, I'm looking for someone. Uh, I'm looking for an administrative person. I'm growing my business, and I'm really looking for someone that um, uh, is a go-getter, uh, would be great you know, with my customers, gives great customer service, uh, and is a hard worker. And here's the job description, and I just bullet point those different items. I need them to do this, do this, do that. Uh, maybe group them into, you know, maybe, um, you know, clerical functions or something like that. Maybe means a lot of other things, but um, you want to list a good eight to ten different uh, bullet points. And then you put the hours of what you're looking for, maybe part-time, ten to two, 
uh, which would be great for you know a mother or someone that uh, their kids are in school and she wants to work you know four hours a week. Um, but that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a part-time person. Then you need to you know again get it out to your COI, post it on your Facebook, let the world know what you're looking for. Uh, and then what I would do, I would also take ten business people in your community that you respect and send them an email directly and say, hey, Tony. Uh, I don't know if you know of anyone that would be interested in a part-time position, but I'm looking to grow my business, and I'm looking for someone to handle these tasks. Uh, anyone that you know that you can refer to me, I really appreciate. Gotten great referrals from that. We call that top grading, right? Going to your the top business people in your area and really trying to find good talent that they know of, because they're more than likely they're not going to send you uh, someone that's going to do a poor job. They're going to send you someone that they can put their name behind. And then the last piece, which I'm not, um, you know, again, you have to go a little bit offline on this, but go to, it's called Indeed.com, I-N-D-E-E-D.com. And if you go to Indeed.com, you can go ahead and post that job description up there. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. You can have a, a, an ad up in about five, ten minutes. You submit it, and it'll just send you all kinds of resume, resumes. So once you have that and you look through a lot of resumes, that's when you're going to go ahead and forward them uh, a letter, uh, email, just saying thanking them for the resume, and uh, I really like what I saw in the resume. And um, what I like you to do, uh, Mr. Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Candidate, is that the next step is that I need you to fill out this personality test. So you just go on to the Craig Proctor website. All of you guys know where this is. Um, on the website, on the resource tab, there's what's called a disk manager. Um, and all I do is I put their name, email address, and I, I get the link, copy and paste it into the email, and I shoot it out to them. And I let them know that you know I need this done within the next uh, 48 to 72 hours. And the candidates that get back to me quickly, those are the ones that I kind of keep my eye on. Uh, if you go beyond 72 hours, I'm not even going to consider you. Um, but the ones that don't even uh, respond to that don't even get uh, a, a next email from me inviting them to a group interview. So out of 20 resumes, I'll give you my last example. Out of 20 resumes that I, I received, only 10 of them did the dispersonality test. Out of those 10, I invited them to come into a group interview on a Saturday at 10 o'clock. I sat down with them. I went over the job description, went over all the different things that we do. I showed them around the office together. And at the end, I had a piece of paper. And basically all it said is, you know, um, you know based on what you saw today, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, um, would you consider or would you be interested in, in taking this position? And I got uh, 10 pieces of paper back, and it was five of them that had circled 10, and then it was a couple nines and eight, you know, a little story, like maybe, but it depends, you know, are the hours flexible or whatever. So um, the only ones I got a one-on-one -on -one interview were the five people that circled 10s. The ones that circled nine, the one that circled... I didn't, I didn't want them. So, but I also looked at the um, the ones that had, you know, the high S, the high C's, uh, I or C, I or S, you know, those type of people. I didn't want someone that had no S, no C, uh, and that was the other consideration. So we ended up actually meeting with three of them. We had three candidates. They came in. Uh, we met with them, and uh, we offered them. We liked them all actually, and we had them come in for three hours to work in our office individually at different times to work with our staff and we paid them for it and um, and the end result we ended up hiring someone that we really liked and she's been great you know she's been really good and that was a position that we would just hire for right away the first person that said yeah I can work 10 to 2 and I can work uh, uh, you know I'm a go-getter I can really do a good job for you those are the people that you know within two three months we just knew they weren't going to work out so we have a great candidate from that. And I know that was a long answer to your question, uh, David, but your COI, um, you know, again, Facebook being part of that, Indeed.com, get out there, look at these people, find someone reasonable to come into your office and do that type of work. Now, the other suggestion is that if you want to do someone that's um, remote uh, or a virtual assistant, uh, then I would try MyOutDesk.com, uh, and they have pretty good 20-hour and 40-hour work schedules that they can help you with that. Uh, and you can find those people reasonably priced uh, in the Philippines for, I think, uh, 860 an hour, uh, David, is what they charge uh, for you to have a, uh, a virtual assistant from the Philippines uh, working with you so you can Skype with them and talk with them. And I've used them in the past, and they're pretty good. Uh, but it does uh, it's not the same as having someone in your office running a bank for you and doing certain things that you really need help on.
All right, next one on here, Brian Kondo. Uh, Brian sends me a, um, a question here. Commissions, uh, getting harder and harder to get two and a half for both sides now, uh, let alone the retainer, okay? So sounds like uh, the type of market you're in, Brian, you're, you're uh, you know, trying to get to, to two and a half on both sides, and maybe you have an agent that's going in there discounting them and bringing it down to, you know, a three or four percent. And I think that really starts off with the expectations. If I'm on the buyer side, doing a good buyer presentation, showing them all the things I'm going to do for them, letting them know that hey, two and a half percent is my is my fee, and um, you know anything below that, um, you know you're going to have to pay the difference. And the three ways you can do that: either the seller's going to pay it, we'll you know we'll include it in the closing costs, uh, or you'll just have to pay a check at closing. Um, so that kind of conversation I've done uh, many, many times, and it's been fine. Sometimes uh, you have to be flexible for whatever reason. Uh, maybe the deal's not going to come together, and you got to do something with that. My brother just did it the other day. He took a percent off a deal, and um, he told the lady, he goes, listen, um, you know, I know your situation. It was a divorce situation. Uh, she was already behind the eight ball. And uh, in order to get the deal done, we were just like $1,500 away or something like that. So she ended up, we ended up, eating it on our end, um, but she ended up giving my brother three referrals. Um, so he said, listen, I'm going to do this, but, you know, in the next uh, couple of weeks, I need to get, you know, two or three referrals from him. He got three referrals the next day. Um, so, you know, you can definitely work with that and try to work with him. But, you know, in all cases, you're not going to always get that. Um, you know, when you're doing that, I, I find that commissions, and, and Craig has taught us this, that cost, which is commissions, right? Um, is only an issue in the absence of value. The more value you show, uh, many times you're going to be able to get that on both sides. Um, but again, Brian, I know you do a great job. Uh, we've talked in the past, and I know you got a great presentation. It could be just your market right now, very competitive, uh, but you just got to let people know this is what I do, this is how I work. And um, if they see that and you show them the value, I think you'll be able to um, you know, definitely uh, get those two and a halfs when you need on both sides. Uh, the retainer, um, I, I got to admit, you know, every once in a while, my agents will come to me and say, uh, this 495, uh, I, you know, I just, people are not going to go with it. They don't understand it. Um, so again, we'll use the, hey, you know what, we're going to go ahead and waive that 495 for you. Uh, but the only thing we ask is that, you know, uh, over the next, you know, as we do business with you over the next six months listing your property or, you know, three months listing your property, you're going to run into people that are, um, you know, you're going to run into people that, that they're going to be looking to buy or sell, right? Your reticular activator is going to be going off. Um, and I really appreciate uh, you giving us an introduction to someone and, and we'll take, you know, we'll make it up that way. And if you don't plant a seed, you're not going to get it. So you definitely want to make sure uh, that you're doing that. All right. Uh, so hopefully, uh, Brian, that helped. You can uh, respond on that chat if it didn't, or if you have any further questions on that, I'll go ahead and elaborate on that. All right. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim had on here, uh, challenge is consistent with making calls to leads. <laughs> consistent with making calls to leads. That is the uh, part three, right, or step three in the Quantum Lead program uh, is the follow-up calls, right, making that lead conversion. And number three, I have to say, Jim, is, is the, by far, um, the most important step in the whole Quantum Lead process. Because if you can generate all these leads, and this system's already proven to do that. We don't have to get into that right now. But if you're not calling these people and you're not converting these leads over into appointments, um, you're wasting all that time and money, right? So um, being consistent when making these leads is, is very important. So two things I want to just comment on on that. Uh, first, you have to block out your lead follow-up time just like a listing appointment, right? Think about a listing appointment for a minute. You make a listing at 3 o'clock, you block it in your schedule from 3 to, you know, 4.30 or 3 to 5, whatever you want to call it, because you know you got to travel there, you got to meet with the customer. Um, what, are, what are things that happen in a listing appointment, right? You're sitting down with them, you're focused on, on that client, and your goal is to get that listing. When you're doing your leads and you block that in your schedule as a listing appointment, um, you're not going to be answering your phone on a listing appointment. You shouldn't be answering your phone. Um, when you're making your lead follow-up calls. You shouldn't be answering emails. You shouldn't be distracted by other people um, if, you, if they know that you're on an appointment with yourself making lead follow-up calls. But if you're very um, disciplined, and this is the key word, discipline, 
discipline, discipline, and you got to make sure you implement that in your week starting on Sunday night. The last thing that I see when I talk to agents about their schedule is lead follow-up time. And you have to put that in your schedule just like a listing appointment. And if you do that and you just block out two hours a day, that's it, two hours a day, whether it's an hour in the morning, an hour at night, but two hours a day is the magic number. Um, and if you do that five days a week, that's 10 hours. You do 10 hours of prospecting calls and follow-up calls on all the leads that you have, you will make more money, you will have more leads, more sales than you can imagine. Um, but the problem is, and if, you all, if you're all honest with yourself and just look at your last couple of weeks, how many hours did you really spend on making prospect calls, right? Some of you would admit to me that you had zero. Some of you would say, huh, I made a couple calls here and there, but I really didn't block out those two hours. Making those two hours are very important. And uh, it, it really applies to the whole 80-20 rule as well. You know, 20% of our, 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 our efforts will deliver 80% of our results. Well, if, you, if you're working a 50-hour work week, right, most agents work a 50-hour work week, the ones that work, you know, four or five, six days a week, whatever it is, but 50 hours is pretty typical. The average real estate agent claims that they do. Um, that's 20%, right? 10 hours of that 50 is 20%. So five days a week, uh, if you miss one of the days and you only did, you know, four days and you had eight hours, then, then be it, you still did a great job for the week. But, you know, zero is not acceptable. Two is not acceptable. You know, eight to 10 hours a week minimum is what you need to be doing in order to be successful and make that. So uh, to answer your question, Jim, make sure that you're applying that uh, and, and putting that in your schedule. Start this Sunday night. Put it in your schedule. Um, I, put, I, I make my schedule with my wife every Sunday night, and we look for the next two weeks, and I put all of my kids' events in there. I put, you know, pickup times, doctor appointments, everything that I want to be involved in, and I put it all in there. I date nights in there and different things that we have. That's first. That's my priority. Uh, we have a business where we can be flexible, and I take a lot of time away from my family working hard, but I make sure that uh, the flexibility is to my advantage with my family, so I make sure I'm on all their functions. Um, once that goes in there, then I'll go ahead and put that lead uh, follow-up time. That's important to have that in there because without that lead follow-up, just like in Jim's case, you're not going to get the, the, the sales or the appointments that you need to do that. So making sure that you put that in your schedule is very important. And then everything else is the 80%, right? It's the going to the bank, uh, going to lunch with a buddy, going to lunch with, you know, you know, an office worker, um, you know, doing fact sheets, uploading stuff in the MLS, playing around with the CMA. That's all the 80% stuff. The most, the one thing you can do, right? Gary Keller's got that book, The One Thing, is making those calls. That's it. Making those calls is the, is the best thing that you can do. So, Jim, hopefully that helped you and answered your question, but uh, that's definitely what you have to do. And then uh, the second piece on that, you know, I said time blocking on uh, those calls um, is making sure that you follow the 3, 4, 12. Don't just call a lead once and then call it again. Don't just, you know, call a lead maybe once or twice, two, three times and say, you know what, it's a bad lead and keep going on. 80% of sales are made on the 5th to 12th contact. So thinking of that, you want to, um, a, and that's one of the plans I didn't show you today on our system, every lead that comes through that has a valid email address and a valid phone number gets launched at 3 4, 12. And what that is is my inside salesperson calls that lead three times in the first 72 hours. If they don't get a hold of them then, it keeps getting pushed off. It doesn't get pushed off because all the, the, the tasks are already assigned. Um, It'll get followed up now once a week for four weeks. That's the four. If after those seven touches, we still couldn't get a hold of that prospect or no return phone call or email, then we're gonna we're gonna follow up with that prospect once a month for 12 months, right? So think about that. That's 19 touches on that one lead over a 13 month period. If we didn't contact that person and return our call, then more than likely we're just gonna delete that lead and it's dead. But if if that person, um, you know, two months down the road, three months down the road, picks up the call and says, hey, I'm ready, or calls us back, we're going to get that lead. And that's what happens with this system is that we find so many people so early in the process that we don't get the chance to um, get them when they're ready to go. And now we're not top of mind with them because we're not reaching out to them and calling them, and they're going with someone else. So if you stay on top of them, keep the follow-up going, 80% uh, of sales are made on a 5th to 12th contact. I guarantee your lead conversions will be so much better. 
and you'll have a, a better way of uh, converting those leads by following that plan. And again, isn't it funny? We go right back to what we started this call with today. It's because we have a process. That's why we're able to convert those leads better than most agents, because most agents get the lead, call two or three times, throw it in a file, and it just gets filed away and they never call it again. All right, so Jim, hopefully that, ha uh, that helped you. Uh, let's see, we got time for a couple more questions. Um, Yep, just got a text from Craig. Say I'm here now, so I can reach out to Craig. Uh, let's see what we have on here. Karen had a couple questions. Um, if a seller lead doesn't give you a valid phone number but a good email, do you keep them? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we email them. Uh, we've sent them video emails, Karen, which is very popular, which I, I suggest every one of you do it. You could do video emails. I had one of my agents yesterday say to me, I don't, I don't know how to do it, Willie. I don't know how to do it. I said, you got three minutes? She says, yeah. I said, come here. Um, she has an iPhone 6 Plus, and I said, come over here. So I said, take a video of me, right? So I said, hey, Melissa, it's Willie. How you doing? And just want to send you a quick video. Uh, hope you have a great day, and uh, give me a call, right? I said, all right, stop the video. She's all right. I says, now, when you go to text a video to someone, you hit that little, you know, that little uh, arrow up? Yeah. Well, what are your options? Text, email, YouTube. I said, well, there you go. Upload it to YouTube. You have a YouTube account. She uploads it to YouTube. And I said, there you go, there's a link. Now go ahead and send that link, text that link, do whatever you want uh, to your contact, and there you go. And she's like, wow, I didn't know it was that easy. I said, that's it, three minutes it took us to do it. Three minutes we had that video already um, out. Once it uploaded, it was, it, was, uh, it took a little bit of time because on the Wi-Fi we were on, but once we uploaded it, maybe it took us five minutes you know, to send it out. But it's that easy. So Karen, what you could do is you could send video emails to them also as part of that 3-4-12 follow-up plan and, um, you know, again, every lead is important, especially if it's in a neighborhood that you're looking to get into or it's a good seller lead, but you just can't get a hold of them. Uh, the video emails definitely take, uh, take it to the next level. Uh, next question on here, if a seller lead uh, doesn't give you a valid email, phone number, do you discard them or keep them uh, for what purpose? So I think I answered that same question. Um, we do, if they, yeah, if I don't get a valid email or a, uh, or a phone number, we just toss them, right? There's dead leads. Uh, let's face it, the three leads, when you get a lead, anytime you get a lead, every lead that you get, there's only three things you're going to do to those leads, guys. You're either going to book an appointment, that's one. If you don't book the appointment, um, then you're going to put it for future follow-up, right? So you're going to kill your 3 4 12 plan and say, okay, Mr. Prospect, um, looks like you're not listening until next year. Uh, would it be okay if I followed up with you? Would it be okay if I put you on my monthly newsletter? Great. Then I'm going to put them, like Craig says, follow up with them in half the time. And if they want to look in December, I'll probably be calling them again in uh, September or so, right? So that's the follow-up. And then the third thing is you're going to delete them. If they're no good, they don't give you the right information, they were rude to you on the phone, delete. Get rid of them. They're done. So hopefully that helps, uh, helps you with that, Karen. Uh, but do you still send the CMA? Um, if I don't have a valid email address and a phone number, I don't send it. If I do have a valid email address, just like Craig says, you always want to send them what they requested. So I would even send a video email and say, hey, attach the CMA you wanted. I'd like to give you a more accurate um, CMA, or you don't call it a CMA, tell them a cost market analysis, where I can give you some tips on what to do and more importantly, what not to do. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, you know, give me a call back or shoot, your, shoot me your phone number and I'll give you a call back to discuss that with you. Uh, there's no cost or obligation for it, you know, something like that. But you want to follow the universal callback script even when you're doing the video email. All right, so I think that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Willie. I got from Karen, so Karen, I hope that helped you out. Um, I see Eric on the line. Eric was great seeing you out the uh, Mets game with uh, James a couple weeks ago. I had a great time, and we're down in uh, in uh, to see our old friend Dean Miller down in uh, New York City. Uh, but um, great stuff here, guys. It was a lot of. Hopefully, you guys got a lot of great feedback on this, and and uh, we're able to um, you know bring take a couple ideas from this call, but. These, these are the type of things that, you know, we kind of look over and, yeah, I know about that, or, yeah, I process, I kind of got it in my mind. If you're going to leverage yourself and you want, if you want to grow your business, you need to leverage yourself with people. And if you don't have people or you don't have an assistant, then you are the assistant, right? And that's okay. I mean, I started myself for a while, and I, I worked alone for, for uh, uh, many months by myself until I really started getting really busy, and I just started losing business, so I needed to hire someone. Once you start getting to about 25 deals, um, it's just you, you can't do it on your by yourself. You need to have um, an assistant help you because if not, you're just losing business because you're not making the, the prospecting calls, you're not going on the appointments you need to go on, and so forth. So 
So hopefully you guys got a lot of value out of this call. Uh, we'll be talking again um, in two weeks. And if you guys, again, like I said, have any questions in the meantime, feel free to shoot me an email at wmiranda at mrgteam.com. And again, I'll be more than happy to forward these plans to you here that I have here in Tina's email. Uh, and again, it's wmiranda at mrgteam.com. All right, so with that, thank you very much. And uh, Andrea, as always, thank you very much. And I guess this is uh, the conclusion of our call. Thank you guys very much. Take care. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful afternoon.